Welcome back to Let's Play Lendra. We are here in the second overall area of Nerud's Lair, and... If you recall from the end of the previous episode, there was an imp who set one of those stone heads to rain some fireball down on us. And there's something really stupid I'm doing, or rather, I should say, really something stupid I'm not doing here. And uh, if you're paying attention a couple of episodes ago, maybe you can figure out what it is. I'll, I'll leave it alone for now, because uh, I'll bring it up a little bit later in this episode. We can climb up to the right side. Really what we need to do is get on that little platform over there that allows us to jump on top of that movable statue. You can shift it to the side, but that ladder is actually broken if you... if you uh, So, moving it to the side will actually make it more difficult for you to make the jump from the little uh, side platform. Anyway, so now that we've done that, we can make our way back up here. Eventually, we'll make our way back up here. It doesn't do too much damage, but there's just so much of it. It takes so long to climb this ladder that it's easy to take a lot of incidental damage here, unless you, you do that one thing I'm sort of obliquely referring to over the course of this uh, first room that I'll talk about a little bit later. Again, it does take 15 hits to kill these things with any given weapon. There's no way to, to make that any shorter, at least as far as I'm aware. Thankfully, of course, the save point is right here, so even though we took a lot of damage, you can just heal back up and head back up to the uh, exit in the upper right-hand corner. This is a nice uh, waypoint for the dungeon overall. We'll be passing through this room a few times, actually, so... Uh, again, there's a lot of ways to take damage to, from all the different hazards. So it's nice to know that we can return here at any point and refill our health. You'll notice there's a groove underneath that column I just pushed down. It's a clue that you can push out of the way and drop down here to reach another statue in the middle of the room we just passed through. And read this sign. The goal here is to find the exit room. The engine room, I should say. And it gives us an order that we have to push some activation switches. These, these are not those switches. We have to activate these ourselves. This is another one of those puzzles where you have to cover up all but one of the switches with statues and get the fourth one yourself. Obviously the only challenge here is realizing that you can push the second statue on top of two of them at once. So that allows us access to this room over here. And you can see there are two switches inside next to the engine and two outside these doors. So you might think that you're supposed to hit these switches and run to the gates as they rise and then try to make it under. But in fact, that has to do with how, how you solve this puzzle. All you're supposed to do is basically hit these external switches in the order that was denoted on the sign in the room above us. The two switches on the inside have nothing to do with anything in this game, in this particular puzzle whatsoever. In fact, they turn automatically once you hit the two external switches in the proper order. So now that we've done that, we have now activated the overall machinery. This is actually a movable golem. It doesn't really come up all that much, but the internal machinery of this thing will come into play in a couple of puzzles later, obviously, so we need to, I guess, send power to the overall structure so that we can complete those puzzles later on. So now that we've done that, we can basically pass by this hole we dropped down and over here to the left, which is probably where you would have gone initially without realizing that you could push that uh, little column to the pit. So yeah, this is pretty mundane. This is similar to puzzles with to uh, some floating platform puzzles we saw in the Magascar. Uh, and this we've seen a million times too, these moving spike balls. I take a lot of hits in this room, just getting that out just just uh, thought I'd mention that right now, because it's I don't know. I don't know. I personally find it's very difficult to watch when less players play really sloppily, and this was just something I had to deal with, because we have to pass through this room five or six times over the course of this dungeon. Just letting you know in advance. So coming here, you'll see that one of those little imp guys lock the door so we can't go through. Uh, and I guess we could have gone to the to the right first as opposed to the left and not uh, and not trigger that sequence right away. Or I should say we could have kept going through this little area and gotten the key that we need to that door first before we activated the scene. I'm not entirely certain that's possible, but I assume it is. Over here, I did not notice there's a switch over there to the north. What you want to do here is hit a switch, and it will cause the platforms to make a round trip. I thought you had to leave a, a bomb to activate the switch so you can get back over to that little uh, chest over there on the lower right, but in fact you can just hit that switch up there. And this contains some herbs, which is nice because I just took all that damage falling into the spikes a bunch of times. In fact, you don't even need to hit the switches, you can just walk across the spikes, they don't do that much damage. Let's pick up this extra herb, no reason not to. Yeah, see, they only do about one or two points of damage, I forget. Anyway, moving on to the next room. Nothing too much here. Another one of those idols. You cannot obviously, you obviously can't destroy it right now. That means it's probably going to be important or useful later. I guess you can't actually destroy them until they're activated. And that's something we noticed from getting in here in the first place. All right, so here we are. We're basically in the right arm, uh, left arm of the sculpture, since he's facing us. 
We've got a, a new series of imps. We've seen the red guy a couple of times in cutscenes, but this is the first time I think we've fought him face to face. He's basically the same as the, uh, the blue guys, except he has a spinning attack. So basically, they, they fight very similar to the Merg, and they take about the same number of hits, so I'd not be surprised if they use mostly the same scripts. Killing those guys picks up the key, and it shouldn't be too difficult to figure out what we're supposed to use this. But of course, now we have to make our way all the way back to the other side of this lair. And of course, this is fairly predictable, as we were heading through this room sort of front-wise. An imp activates this statue, and now we have to figure out how to blow it up. We can't get to that floating platform yet, which is another clue that we, uh, that there was something else we would have to do coming back to the zoom the other way. Basically, what you have to do is just equip your hunter's bow, stand here on this platform. You cannot jump from the lower platform, which means you have to expose yourself to his attacks. And he will shoot, basically, first a spiked ball and then a fire phantom, or a fireball. So, I take a lot of hits here. This is actually where I take the most of the damage I take this entire, uh, episode of this Let's Play, unfortunately. I don't know, I guess because I assumed I was so close to the central waypoint where we could use the save point, I didn't need to worry about taking the, too much damage, but I guess it's also the fact that since there's a pit of spikes right there to the, uh, uh, between you and the idol, it's very easy to take a lot of damage without even realizing how much you're taking. So yeah, get on the floating platform, which now moves, and we can now re-enter the central spike room and make our way back to the right arm and see what the heck was so important on the other side of... Well, I should say, in the right arm in the first place, that we need to be that we need to get there to progress in this dungeon. So of course, yes, I have to make it through this room one more time with only ten points of health left. I guess I just realized I was this this low on life, so I guess I tried to be a little bit more careful. I only took one hit, thankfully. Okay, so we unlock this door, and now this looks very similar to the other hand, except now we've got a sign to read, and this guy's gonna come back and. Of course, I mean, the keys, you know, it's standard Zelda logic, we can only use the keys once before they disappear forever, so even though we just used the key to unlock that door to get in here, we cannot use the same key to get out. So, that says, start with the most delicate finger, what we're supposed to do here is move these platforms in the order, starting from the pinky, with that little machinery over on the left representing the thumb. And what this is going to do is it's going to open up uh, the clenched fist of the statue outside, so the next thing we're going to want to do is go outside, again through the same central passageway that we, with the save point, and see the results of our handiwork. It was basically something that was blocking us from progressing in the game, in the in, sort of up the, the series of stairs, that and we'll see that obstacle get out of our way once we get outside. Yeah, large boulders seem to have fallen to the next room. So yeah, we can use these boulders to, to, to make our way back out. Thankfully that worked, otherwise we would have been in a lot of trouble. It would have been a shame if we have been able to unlock our way, you know, back out of this area. You know, without actually, I should say, unlock our way forward without actually being able to get out of the locked room. Especially considering we already blew the one key. Okay, so the easiest thing to do now to get back is just to jump back into this pit, and it will take you back to the central room for the second level. We'll save our game and uh, replenish our health, and we'll go see the results of our handiwork outside. Yes, that this is totally automatic. You do not need to do this to avoid any damage. It's a cutscene. That, uh... Fist unclenches and allows us to progress. First off, we can pick up this chest, which contains the Earth Book, the upgraded Earth Magic. And again, as soon as I have a decent opportunity to show that, uh, I will do so. And we can make our way back around, since you cannot jump back over the uh, fist from this from this side. We can make our way back around and into the guy's chin, basically. So here we go. He's going to drop five of these guys on us. I am not going to show this, because you can just sort of stand in between them and they can't even hit you. I'm not going to show 75 hits on these things. Let's just assume I did that without taking any damage. Still didn't figure out the one smart thing I should be doing, but uh, in the next room I'll finally cover that. The guy's leading us into that pit over there. This is pretty easy to get to. We can just sort of shove these statues out of the way. There's no, there's no trick. There's nothing hidden. Just, uh, to basically just push them the way, the way you think you need to go, the only way you can go, and you'll be able to drop into the little pit over there. I guess it was hard here actually finding where you have to leverage yourself against that one statue. Pay attention to the order these statues fall down, and they can only be damaged in that order. Otherwise, there's no real trick here. This is where I finally figured out what we're supposed to be doing. These all have fire attacks, which means we can equip Navis Charm, which allows us to take no damage from fire. I pointed that out explicitly that's what it does when we picked it up in the Caretaker's house in the first place. So, the only one you have to watch out for now is this guy who shoots this laser. It does something like 10 points of damage if it hits you, which is pretty insane. But otherwise, this is pretty easy to do. The only trick here is if you don't realize that only one of the statues can be damaged at a time, you might be fooled into believing that you can't damage them at all if you pick the wrong ones. Otherwise, not too hard. So, 
the, our reward for making it this far is a key. We can ride this platform to get make our way back out the same way we came in. I'll skip to that. And you'll notice there's a door here with an obvious keyhole in it in the right shoulder of the statue. So, I assume this is the same guy who's been who's been bugging us the entire time for the last several rooms, since he's not the pink guy anymore. I guess we killed him in the left arm. So, we can jump on top of the spike ceiling and get a block to the head. That's actually what happens if you take too long. Hit this switch to low, lower the door. This switch on the, floor, on the wall does absolutely nothing. It's what activates the trap in the first place. Here, there's a couple of things we can do. Since we did take a little damage, I'll go ahead and use a strength elixir because it's what happens to be in this chest over here. Next we want to get rid of the... move the upper left statue out of the way so we can move the l upper right statue out of the way. You'll notice we're, we're above those five statues the other guy dropped out of us before. We're very close to the end of the dungeon actually. So what we're gonna do now is head across this bridge and finally we're gonna get revenge on this guy who's been pissing... who's been uh... Formation 42, yeah. I assume that's a Hitchhiker's Galaxy reference, but I'm not entirely certain. It could just be a, a funny number the developers thought of. Then again, considering the number of arbitrary pop culture references in this game so far, I wouldn't be surprised if it was, in fact, a, 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 you know, a standard Science Fiction 42 reference. The statue appears after you kill those three uh, four guys. One of them comes into the little hole in the wall over there, and... Uh, talking to the statue actually makes something appear over the hole, over the, the, the hole so more of them can't spawn. Pick up our life vessel, and swap recording sessions there. And we can proceed finally to the central room and come face to face with Nerud. The giant golem that we were crawling around in was in fact not Nerud. This is Nerud here and he's pretty pissed for some reason or another. He's gonna test us. We have a boss fight on our hands and it's a very strange boss fight. By far the weirdest boss fight we've we've had to deal with so far. That I guess is supposed to be Nerud. It's smaller than his the projection of his head. I guess this is how big he's actually. I guess this is what one of the giants actually looks like, more or less. So he's gonna dislodge himself from whatever he's stuck in right now, and he's gonna come at us. He's got the same, uh... roar animation that a lot of bosses have. Basically, he's gonna, he's gonna come at us, we cannot damage him at all. The only thing you can do is escape. You wanna get down to the bottom of the screen as fast as possible. The only thing you have to actually have to break are the really large blocks. You can only use the flail to do it, unless you happen to have uh, King Snow's sword. You can jump over the short one, so basically all you want to do is just keep going at these large blocks. You take quite a bit of damage if he catches up to you, which he does here, because for some reason I cannot get the hits to register on this one big block over here. So the, the only problem I have with this boss fight, or I should say this run on this boss fight, is getting away from this first time. Once you get, once you get sufficiently clear of him, uh, there's no real challenge here, because it's actually pretty easy to stay away. What's going to happen is, over time, bits of rock are going to flake off of him. Uh, and as soon as he reaches the bottom of the area, basically where you came in in the first place, the fight is over. You never actually have to attack him, you only have to escape him. I don't know how this represents sort of a test of courage or whatever it was he was trying to, you know, use to evaluate us. It's really weird. Yeah, every time he roars like that, something falls off of him. And uh, if you get down far enough, the rocks actually completely stop spawning. The ones that are falling in the foreground, they don't do any damage at all. So yeah, we can actually go back up and see him. You can see that... Uh, the stone's fallen off of his arms to reveal some kind of sinew or whatever, and now, in a minute, it's gonna fall off uh, the left side of his chest, too, where his heart is. Any minute now. It's really weird. Oh, no, no, it's off his face. The last piece is his chest. And then the boss fight just sort of arbitrarily ends. It's very strange. Yeah, there we go. So, yeah, all you wanna do is reach the bottom of the area as fast as possible, and then the rest of the boss fight is pretty straightforward, because... Uh, actually, it's pretty easy, all things considered. And now he's kinda doing a weird, uh pulsing thing. I'm not sure what the deal is. So yeah, that was enough to convince him that we were on his side. I'm not really sure why. Uh, I'm honestly also not really sure what the giants were. I'm pretty sure they were supposed to represent like large nature spirits or something, like Majora's Mask giants or whatever. Because, I mean, I don't know. He's, he's magical. He's not a person. Well, this, can do. this is actually a fairly long cutscene, but it's going to introduce a, a character we haven't seen before. Someone that if you had the instruction booklet, you would have actually seen, and sort of wondered when he was actually going to start to play a part in the storyline. This is Zorgia. He's basically Melzis' chief <laughs> lieutenant. He's got an awesome laugh, kind of like a... I don't know, kind of kind of reminds me of a... I don't, I don't recall if this actually appeared in the game, but it kind of reminds me of something that like, Dracula would do in Symphony of the Night or something. Anyway, he's extremely strong. He's one of the most powerful enemies in the game. 
and he's capable of doing a tremendous amount of damage, apparently to Nerud, which means he's capable of standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the ancient guardians who sealed Melzus in the first place, which is pretty intimidating, and now he's going to go head-to-head uh, -head with us, which I guess makes up for the fact that we had such a crummy boss fight against Nerud himself. But of course, we're not nearly strong enough to actually go face-to-face -face with Zorgia right now. That's something that we're saving for much, much later in the game. We will take a swing at him, because because that just seems like something that we should do while he's distracted. I guess it was enough, you know, the, the imps that we've been fighting all along finally showed up, finally noticed there was something going on. They got the ones we didn't kill on our way here. And they're pretty pissed. Of course, they totally miss Zorgia, even though he was right there. And I would assume he left a hole or something when he came in. Left. So yeah, they're pretty bloodthirsty little guys. Rude, buddy, anytime you wanna wanna speak up in my defense. I know you don't look so good right now. Flickering thing he's doing. I'm so glad this is emulating correctly. I wouldn't have expected weird visual effects like that to uh, to not glitch on me. I got lucky. Okay, so yeah, we've got the you know the pure messiah complex going on right now. So that teleporter leads out, and uh, any minute now, this is going to. This place is going to self-destruct because he's no longer holding it together. He's going to give us his crest, the fifth overall, and we're going to head out and pick it up and proceed with the, the rest of the story in the next episode of Let's Play Alundra. As soon as we get out of here, I will see you then.